Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are finally reaching the crossing the finish line of Hack for Rare. Uh, today is July 30th, 2021, and we are about to present all of the projects, amazing teams that participated. Um, so I have a few slides uh, today um, just to introduce the day and the meeting, but then I will pass it on to Lucas for all the, um, all of the play out. So thank you, you made it. Congratulations, you crossed the finish line. So now it's time to have a look at all the amazing projects that you guys worked on so hard over the five weeks and see what you have achieved. I'm sure we'll be surprised and we'll, we'll make a lot of progress for, for all of the rare disease that you tackled. So what will happen is that today we'll have the first look at your three minutes presentations. And today is actually the first day where the judges will start reviewing your submissions. Um, but make sure that you complete your project submission on Synapse by 11.59 tonight uh, Eastern time. So you still have time, you still have about 12 hours. Uh, you can complete your submissions and make sure that you um, also are all good to go for, um, for your project. Judges will complete reviews next week and will announce the winners on August 10 at 12 p.m. So the registration details for that meeting is on Hack for Rare on our uh, webinar agenda. Also, make sure you have an incubation application section uh, on your project page to be considered for incubation prizes. This is very important. Otherwise, um, you will compete for first, second, and third place. But if you have, um, if you want to apply for incubation, you need to have this incubation application section. Details of how to structure this section, it's not very long, it's two, two page max. Uh, you can refer to the attendee guide that is on the website or the rules page that is on hackforrea.org. And also, the complete list of judges is available on hackforrea.org. I will have it also at the end of my presentation. So today, uh, projects, this is the agenda on how this is going to work. Projects will be played by track, starting from number one, uh, track number one, uh, neurofibromatosis, and then we'll move to track two, P10, and rhizopathies. And then track four also, uh, this MOI tumor single case, the collaborative track. As we line up the project presentation, we'll also ask team members to be ready at the end of their presentation to answer one or two quick questions from the judges before we move on to the next one. So Lucas will call you and will also post now on the chat the order by which we'll um, run all of, through the projects. So you know when your projects is actually lined up on what position so you can get ready. Make sure that you have short answers because the projects will be played for about three minutes and then we'll allow only one max two minutes for both Q and A. So your, your, your replies, your um, answers should, has to be very, very quick. So Lucas will coordinate the playback and we'll catch up all the teams to line up and be ready. And we'll call up. So good luck, everybody. So before we move to the presentations, just want to thank our sponsors and data partners. Uh, NTAP, the Gilbert Family Foundation, Vushi Aptek, Salesforce, Helix, Recursion Pharmaceutical, Charles River, Sage by Networks, Varsum, DNA Nexus, AstraZeneca, the Children's Brain Tumor Network, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, RESI, Redefining Early Stage Investments, Elsevier, DNF Open Science Initiative, DNF Data Portal, and DNF Registry. And also thanks to all of our community partners that helped us to spread the words and recruit a lot of teams and also contribute to some of the um, prizes, incubation prizes. So the other thanks goes to our amazing list of mentors that I will not read, but you can see on screen. We had a lot of uh, talented mentors that dedicated their time that you were able to reach out to. 
So thank you, thank you so much to all of them for uh, their contributions. And also um, thank you to our uh, amazing judges that will have some work to do now um, to review all of the projects and decide who are the winners. So thank you so much for your work. So I think I'm the end at my presentation and I will stop sharing my screen and I will um, pass it to Lucas who will start to with, with the first team. So Lucas. Awesome, thanks Salvo. And thank you everyone for joining as well as for sending me your pitches. Some of you squeaked in just at the final second there for sending them to me, but that's okay, you made it. So congratulations to everyone. And I won't waste too much time here since we have quite a few pitches to go through. So I will start sharing my screen and team the gang with pitch number eight. You are up first. So in a moment, I will start your video. And then as Salvo mentioned, we will have a couple minutes for uh, questions after the video concludes. So here we go. Hello, my name is Triyaksh Mathur and I am from page 008, team name, The Gang. And the tool we have made is Sophos. Optical pathway glioma is a slow growing brain tumor that arises in and around optic nerve. As the tumor progresses, it presses the optic nerve, causing child's vision to worsen. To treat this, researchers are developing transplantable retinal ganglion cells from stem cell. This is a long process that I'll be explaining later in the pitch. The crucial part of this process is to differentiate between the retinal and non-retinal cell line. And the current method for this used is fluorescence microscopy, which is invasive and it requires probing, etc. For this, we are developing an automated prediction tool that will predict and differentiate between retinal and non-retinal cell lines by just going through bright field microscopic images. A sample image I have attached here. The left image is of retinal and the right one is of non-retinal. Computer algorithm will recognize retinal cells before onset of reporter gene expression, reducing the usage of invasive technique and increasing the efficiency of the project. The whole process is of 21 days. First day is aggregate formation. Neuroepithelium is formed at day five, where our tool can be used to differentiate and predict retinal and non-retinal cells. If we go through con uh, conventional techniques, it can be only be done after day nine when optical vesicle is formed. So probing can be done. Here is a snap of our website. User has to upload the image and then provide his or her email ID so that the results can be submitted directly to the mail. Implementation. Our tool can be used by researchers to increase efficiency of stem, stem cell based treatment of rare diseases. It was difficult for us to get access to data set of microscopic images. So we will be also developing a digital library where researchers and academicians can access and get references. The research market for stem cell is 14.7 billion USD and hence growing at the rate of 10.24 in year 2021 to 2026. Here is the how our process, the whole tool will work. User will upload the image on the website. The neural network algorithm will run and the output can be obtained. To access the data sets and develop the digital library, we will be partnering with some organization, some I have listed here, like Child Children's Tumor Foundation, Sage Bio Network, PTE, and etc. And here is our team. Thank you. Awesome. That is it for Team The Gang. So before I kick it over to the judges for any questions, just a reminder that Team Drug Matrix uh, with Dao Chin Sun, you are up next. Uh, but like I was saying, uh, judges, any questions, do feel free to ask now. So you can unmute yourself 
and ask the question now. And I just want confirmation if someone from the gang is ready to answer. Uh, can yeah, have... yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Thanks. Oh, so much. Awesome. Yeah, so I received a question. Okay, so uh, is that is there a file type restriction? At now, you can upload JPG and PNG both as a file. Yeah, so, yeah. And maybe another question from me. So um, the how can you give us some idea of what the, how the neural network will work? Um, it's just it looks like a black box now, but just yeah. yeah. Got it. So usually it will be working on a something called a image classifier, which is uh, so we'll be uh, we need to provide database. Uh, we need to provide the data sets of images, and we need to classify them. So and train the machinery. And the um, data set we need to provide is huge. Uh, is quite a, a large uh, around more than thousand to two thousand images, so that the machine can train and efficiency can be increased up to 97%. And another question from um, Enkada, what was the predictive accuracy of the test set? Okay, so the uh, predictive accu accuracy was around 90% on the test set. Okay, and maybe last question from me is uh, your project page, does it have the code that you guys are planning to use or some part of it? Do you have a working um, a working uh, prototype for the project or not? Okay, so we have provided with the code for the front end and the digital library that you can access. For uh, the back end, now the efficiency uh, means the, uh, the percentage is quite low because I also mentioned in the page, we are not able to access data. It is quite rare of us to access it. So, so we were thinking of creating a digital database so that other people should not suffer how we suffer in training the machinery in stem cells. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. And to keep things moving along, we're going to go to the next presentation. Uh, but team the gang, you're more than welcome to answer any other questions that come up through the chat. Uh, so up next, we have Drug Matrix with Dao Chun Sun. And then after that, uh, team DCD, you will be next. So I will play the next video now. Hello everyone, my name is Dao Chun Sun. I represent my team, Drug Metrics, to present our project, Gene Network Guided Drug Combination in Planks for Neural Fibroma. Drug combination is a very hot area for both clinical study and basic research. However, there is many pain points down to the path. First, most drug combination are tested on the cell lines, which we call that in vitro system. That is quite different from the clinical setting, what we call it in vivo, which lead to the high failure rate in the downstream drug combination verification. Second, when we combine the two drugs, we have to keep in mind the toxicity and the side effects of the drug. Third, the high cost of the large scale lab test on the drug combination is really the bottleneck preventing us to explore the new combinations. Last but not least, Optimization of the drug combination dosage is really time and effort consuming. In this hackathon project, we, pro we propose a strategy to identify the conserved gene regulation network shared both in vivo and in vitro. And we combine the drugs target different biology networks to avoid or to reduce the toxicity. And we, we can predict the combination efficacy is based on the single agent screening and also evaluate the new combinations in silicon. And at last, we will provide a ranked combination with a predict working dosage for the drug. This strategy based on the last year's NF1 hackathon project in which we identified the conserved gene regulation network shared between the 
uh, cell lines using the drug screen and the primary human tumor tissue. We then calculate the correlation between the drug response and the gene neg network. Use that correlation, we clustered all the drug candidates into distinct pattern. In this heat map, every row is the gene regulation network and every column is the drug candidates. Use those correlations, we can, we can separate the drugs with distinct pattern and those correlation can serve as the fingerprint relevant to the uh, drug efficacy in vitro and in vivo. Very interestingly, we identify that there is a matched or complementary pattern between the drug clusters, such like drug cluster one to drug cluster five, two to four, three to six. And this kind of matched pattern may help us to avoid side effects or toxicity of the drug, which targeting the same bioprocess. We further use the drug annotation to filter out the drug candidates and then use the IDA combo package and the single agent drug screen data to provide a ranked list which has the selected or predicted drug dosage and rank them use the combination score. We also have some brilliant ideas we want to uh, follow up for the incubation price. We want to acknowledge our mentors who helped this project, Jeffrey Field and Sun Lee, and all the hacks on our organizers. And all the hackers in these events really help us and stimulate us a lot. Thank you very much. Awesome. We have a couple of minutes for questions for Drug Matrix. And then as another reminder, uh, Team DCD, you will be next. Uh, so any questions from the judges? And just to confirm if Dauchin, you are here, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So if you could go off. Yes. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yep, yeah. yep, I can hear you. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, for the first question, uh, for the FDA approved drugs, I mean, we limited uh, all the drug candidates uh, to the first FDA approved and also which are in the status of uh, uh, clinical trial two and uh, two and three so far, but uh, definitely we can ex I mean, expand the candidates list to explore more uh, combination types, I mean, all possibilities. And also for the second question, uh, we haven't uh, seriously incorporated the patient uh, reported drug side effects yet, but we do check from uh, FDA website, they do have some uh, common side effect report on all the published or all the approved drug. And we can incorporate that information too uh, to avoid you know, similar uh, side effects. And, uh, this is on our to-do list also. Thank you. Awesome. Any last questions for Daochun before we go to DCD? All right, and uh, like I mentioned before, if any other questions come through, Daochun, do feel free to answer them in the chat. And then up next, we have Team DCD. And after that, so the team can get ready, will be QDoc. So here we go with DCD. We are the Team DCD. We are developers, data scientists, passionate to help healthcare. During this hackathon, we experienced that the amount of available imaging data is not enough to train a really robust deep learning solution. Therefore, our idea is to create synthetic NFN positive MRI scans. It can solve this problem of dataset limitations in the field of rare diseases. Why is it an issue that the amount of imaging data is very limited? 
The lack of enough images is bad for data scientists and deep learning developers, since AI solutions can be well trained on large data sets only. And it is also bad for clinicians, since they have less chance to get enough experience to recognize a rare tumor with a high confidence or in an early stage. During the university years, a student can confront a lot of common diseases. However, they might not see a rare disease or they just see the same examples in the medical books. Data from real cases are hard to share due to legal limitations. So the problem has two sides. Lack of data or the use of data is limited. All solution creates synthetic MRI images. It provides a nearly unlimited amount of data since the only limitation is the computational resource. Or idea has a real market impact. That's why it can exist as a donation-based solution or as a for-profit startup. During the hackathon, we built a generative neural network to show sample images. The network contains two different artificial intelligences. The first one creates the images and the second one controls the whole process. They teach each other. This is a well-known method in data science. It is like a tandem of a cup and a rubber. When the rubber can wrap the bank, the cup learns to protect all money. Next time the rubber fails and learns how to do a better job to fill the money bags. In the end, we will have a well-protected bank and a well-skilled rubber. At the moment, our model is a generic one. To train a real-life proof solution, we need more time, especially computational time. We have a full development roadmap. First of all, we create medium quality MRI scans with no disease and with NF1 tumors. In the next phase, we implement the customization part to drive the synthesis. For example, number, size, and location of tumors. Our final goal is to create high quality MRI images. To maximize the impact for data science, we want to provide not only the images, but a complex metric system that helps evaluating the models. Please support us. Thank you. Awesome. Any questions for Team DCD? If you are here, please do feel free to come off of mute to answer. And like I previously said, Team QDoc, you will be up next. Um, but any questions for Team DCD? <clears throat> there is a question on the chat from Nick. And I see others. Yes, is there enough uh, commonality in NF1 for again to? Um, it's quite a good date. Uh, it's quite a good question. Um, therefore, we are uh, now at the uh, medium level image uh, phase. So we are thinking that there are methods uh, where we can create a discriminator, a discriminator which is uh, talented enough to. Uh, force the generator network to produce uh, really good quality images. But this really costs time and, and, and efforts of uh, experimenting with different uh, function. So it's, it's almost, uh, almost uh, the barrier of uh, being the data enough or not enough. Um, other question was, uh, any sample images you will be able to generate? Yes, we will uh, post uh, sample images to the submission form and to uh, the repository as well. So we have one. So we have more images to uh, show how it works now. Even in high quality answers. Yes, the, the errors in uh, generative uh, networks are quite common. Uh, therefore, our plan is to make uh, image quality uh, algorithms that can uh, manage uh, that kind of errors. We received uh, quite good uh, uh, insights from mentors uh, wh where to uh, focus uh, when we create those algorithms or how to create them. So what to focus to. Thank you. Awesome. And then we will go on to our next team, which is team QDoc. And after that, so you know it's coming up, is team ACCD BCM. So you will be up next. And here is team QDoc. Hello. 
My name is Ramez uh, in group 35 with Clara and Lucy. We're here to present our project. It's QDoc Quantum Machine Learning Powered Healthcare Platform. Traditionally, diagnosing a patient's condition has been based heavily on the umbrella approach, which is based on the patient reported symptoms, resulting in an umbrella diagnosis and general treatment that frequently fails to achieve their intended effects due to individual variability. As an example of the use of our platform, it's a precision based approach for healthcare. We use a user-friendly mobile interface that will collect a large amount of relevant medical data from our patients, input data like recent symptoms, birth and gender, residence and traveling, lifestyle details, genetic exams, family tree, allergies, and disease history. QDOT's rare disease chatbot helps patients with large amounts of information on their disease turn to their mobile phones as their first source of information. In three easy steps, a patient can determine their rare disease risk, get personalized results, and take proactive action. We focus on user interface and user experience development, making it easily accessible to, for anyone to enter their symptoms into the chat box. Aims to tailor prevention and treatment approach to the individual. Due to the complexity of human biology, individualized medicine requires taking into account aspects that go well beyond the standard medical care. In fact, medical care only has a relative contribution of 10 to 20% to outcomes. More detailed analysis shows that there's more interplaying factors and further the mutations found in the cancer such as ERB B3 could be used to find the predisposition of the person. The hybrid neural network solution takes advantage of PyTorch and KizKit's algorithms to optimize for a risk analysis. On the right, you can see the technical architecture. The data is sent to a parameterized quantum circuit and unitary gates for each parameter matrix is applied to output features. We would be able to integrate all of these risk factors to produce a reliable probability of an individual developing a specific rare disease like NF. Medicine is identifying and explaining relationships among interventions and treatments on the one hand and outcomes on the other hand in order to provide the next best medical action at the individual level. This will leave us for more accurate, earlier and more granular results. Support features include social media awareness, NF-specific support groups, humanizing with survivor stories and medical research professional hub. We are a diverse team with technical experience in physics, computer science and genetics. For this hack, we actively collaborated with over 10 mentors over the Hack for Rare Slack. As scientists, we are excited to be part of the rare disease community and will continue building out our future roadmap. Awesome. Well done, Team QDoc. Any questions? And as another reminder, uh, Team ACCD BCM, you are up next. But uh, if you're here from Team QDoc, feel free to come off mute and we will see if there are any questions. Just want to mention that uh, judges are free to unmute themselves and also ask the question um, via the mic, of course, or if you prefer to type it in, that's also okay. Hi, this is Nick. Um, I just wanted to confirm that the data that uh, the patient inputs to the application is then sent on to the doctor, There's is, or is there an automated uh, piece of diagnosis that the app is also attempting to perform? Hi, Lucy from QDOT. Um, this also links to Vanessa's question, so thank you for asking that. Um, a huge part of working with medical data is um, being able to connect that data with, from the patient with the doctors and the medical personnel. So we're working with um, clinical trial data in addition to data from OrphanNet and NF Data Portal. And we're also combining that data with the data that um, the patient enters individually via their mobile phone. Okay, thank you.
Awesome. Any other questions for Team QDoc before we move on? Uh, one question from me, Lucy. Um, is this platform something that you guys have developed for this specific competition, or is is, is an idea that is coming from um, let's say previous idea? I mean, I just want to see if this is brand new or is something that you are um, developing since you know a while. Yeah, we started uh, the end of June uh, last month. Um, we mainly use third-party libraries. So for instance, Kiskit, um, PyTorch, like it, it, it isn't really anything special. What's special here is um, that we're using data specific to um, the NF data portal. So that's, that's how we're addressing the rare disease problem. Thank you. Awesome. And then if there's any more questions in the chat, uh, Lucy, you're always welcome to answer those in chat. And up next, we have Team ACCD BCM and Team American. You will be up next. While interviewing a caregiver, we listened as she spoke about her son's difficulty maintaining a friend group due to him being smaller than his peers. Another mentioned receiving dirty looks from strangers while using handicapped facilities. Although she deals with fibroma-induced chronic pain, her illness is invisible. When thinking of NF, many of us often think first of the symptoms, and this is valid. It's important that clinicians focus on these for the health of their patients. Yet, the aforementioned situations also directly stem from NF and deeply affect quality of life. Many solutions address purely the clinical symptoms. Very few approaches tackle the holistic experience of living with this disease. Based on our findings from exploratory research, we decided to focus on a modified version of the third challenge on the NF track. How can we help patients navigate information on their disease, as well as tackle the social and personal issues that stem from having NF? Our solution is Let's Talk About NF.com, a curated podcast and associated website in which we surface topics voted on by the NF community and then invite groups of patients, clinicians, and caregivers to discuss in depth. This allows stakeholders, especially those that don't live near an NF clinic, to discover others with shared experiences and hear their stories so that they're better equipped to tackle their incorporeal challenges. While there are amazing examples of individuals sharing their entire experience with NF online, we aim to have each episode focus on a specific aspect, but from multiple viewpoints, so listeners can help make sense of the exact situations that they're going through. While we toyed with many formats of delivering this information, we ultimately chose a podcast for a few critical reasons. Podcasting has exploded in popularity for the past few years, and continues to grow. With this, services like Spotify make it so that in addition to the website, the content is easily discoverable and can be embedded into online groups or even the CTF site. In addition, podcasting emphasizes a conversational format, which will allow the clinical aspects of the content to be more approachable and the emotional aspects to resonate more deeply. Here's a quick snippet of one of the episodes we've already produced. And I ended up bringing along my sister-in-law for an important appointment with him and having her there helped me to stand up for myself in a way that I typically don't have to stand up for myself. It just gave me the internal strength. We're excited about the response the solution has already generated. When making a post asking if there were individuals interested in sharing a story about their NF, we received many topic requests and offers to help in production itself. Podcasts and other disease parallels, such as cancer and diabetes, have been vital to their communities and garnered large audiences. We fleshed out our idea, built the first iteration of the site, and recorded proof of concept podcasts. This timeline shows our plan to build a self-sustaining project that can start to benefit the NF community immediately. A few key steps include finding partners who are part of the NF community to ensure appropriate representation in the production stage. Also, as a first step, we've transcribed podcast content, but also believe it is critical to create a site that goes further than baseline accessibility so that anyone can have access. Additionally, pilot testing episodes will allow us to nail the podcast format and tone. We have created a 180-day proposal with clear steps for execution, and we're excited about continuing this work as we believe that our concept can be executed at high quality and can start to provide positive value in just three months. Before we conclude, we'd like to thank all the clinical and patient mentors we had the opportunity to learn from over the course of this hackathon. Thank you. Awesome. Well done. Feel free to come off of mute if you're representing your team. Uh, and now we will kick it over to the judges for any questions. And as a reminder, Team American, you are up next. Uh, but any questions from the judges? 
Hey, uh, <clears throat> one question on our side. Uh, in terms of uh, the stories or the types of uh, topics that we cover in this, how would you, how are you anticipating keeping this fresh? In, in terms of like, I know a lot of patient groups do things like this where they put out people's stories or they address a topic. Is that the idea that you would repository it and and leave it there, or would you do an update, you know, six months or twelve months later? Kind of how do you keep that fresh um, versus going kind of into redundancy? Been there, done that, heard that already. Oh, that's a really good question. So what we're planning on doing is first having and the NF community itself vote on the ideas and topics that they're most interested in listening to. And like you said, we'll always, um, we're always open to the idea of updating the podcast themselves with new and fresh uh, takes. And also we're going to plan on having live comment hours where the guests of the podcast themselves uh, can answer any questions that uh, users and uh, listeners might have on the comment section itself. And are you anticipating, sorry, follow up question, are you anticipating tracking that data and like, how are you going to utilize yes. that in so, terms of, okay. Um, sorry, you can, I think I cut you off in the last bit. No, I think you were going to, you were, you probably got the gist of the question. How are you, how are you going to use that information that the, the back and forth? Gotcha. So uh, right now, podcast analytics are quite limited. They only give us the number of downloads and the number of uh, devices that people are listening on. But then recently with like Apple and Google, um, maybe even Spotify, they're showing a little bit more analytics and demographics. So like if we know, for example, that a more that an older audience is listening to our podcast, we can ch uh, change our tonal shift a little bit more uh, to that demographic. But if it's younger audiences, then we'll have a better idea as to like maybe the types of topics that they're more interested in. Hi, uh, this is Dao Chen, and uh, yeah, I just don't have a question, but I want to comment something. I think this is a very great work. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just thinking uh, whether it's possible based on those information on the podcast uh, in the future, you would can do some kind of a Alexa or, or Google Assistant, this kind of a tools to incorporate and uh, or in depth all your podcast and all the information. So, so the the, the people or, or, or the family members can ask those kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, questions to Alexa or Google Assistant, which can easily help them to navigate and uh, response. And uh, then you also can follow all the people's questions and uh, try to make uh, the community get together, the researchers and the clinicians and the patients among themselves. Just, uh, just a comment. No, Dr. Sun, that's a great idea. And actually, um, this is more detailed more in our project page, but then we actually have transcriptions for each of our podcasts. And like you said, in order to do any machine learning for, uh, later on, we need the raw data uh, that we're going to work on. And so uh, the transcription has uh, threefold purposes. The first one, of course, is for accessibility. And the second one is to enable um, higher search engine optimization. So when people are searching similar questions, our podcast would surface on the top of each of uh, the Google results. And also for the third one, um, we can use it to build machine learning models for Alexa or Google Assistant, like you mentioned. Yeah, great. I just hope yeah, you guys can continue to work on this. And uh, yeah, that's really great. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Benkada. I think there are a few other questions on the chat. You can feel free to um, answer it. Sure. Um, oh, Dr. Reddy. I, you, you can actually answer on the chat because oh, we okay. have already past the okay. one two minutes thank you okay thank you awesome thank you so much and up next is team american and to get ready after that is team 14 uh with activity you will be up next uh but here is team american Our mission at American Airlines is to care for people on life's journey. That's why our operations research and advanced analytics team partnered with the Children's Tumor Foundation, which helps families like mine who have lost loved ones to neurofibromatosis. It's my privilege to introduce the incredible progress our team has accomplished in the Hack4 Rare Hackathon. Thank you, Patty. Due to the rarity of NF cancer, the needed patient data is available. This hinders the progress in the NF research and effective treatment discovery. But how we can make best use of the limited data and preserve the information for accurate pattern discovery? One approach to address this is to find similar genomic information from other types of cancers. But these approaches focus only on aggregate level gene information and disregard the transcript information and patient history. This limits us from effectively preserving the interactions among genes, 
patients' samples, leading to information loss as well as inference bias. Instead, to generate more accurate representations for NF patients, you leverage the transcript level gene expression while considering their history. These representations can be used to identify similar patients from other domains. From there, we can identify useful treatments for NF patients. Such representations can also be used as input features in other supervised learning methods. We propose a graph neural network-based framework to model the gene expression data. GNN-based models have shown tremendous success in areas like language modeling, particle physics, bioinformatics, and recently in protein folding problem by DeepMind. We believe that GNN can leverage the interactions among different entities in this genomic data, thereby produces more accurate representation. We first represent the gene expression data as a heterogeneous network, and then use deep work based GNN to generate representations for genes, samples, patients, as well as transcripts. We use open PBTA data set to generate results with our framework. Now let's move on to our visualization. Once we have the node representations, we, we visualize them and overlay their pathology diagnosis for all of the samples. And as you can see here, most of the samples which are closer together have the same diagnosis, such as meningioma. And here you can see low grade glioma. Therefore, just from our visualization, we can see that our unsupervised approach is accurately able to cluster similar types of nodes together. To further validate the accuracy of generated node representations, we also build a classification model where we use these nodes rep node representations to classify the tumor samples to one of the 40 pathology diagnoses. And we were able to predict the pathology of the samples with 70% accuracy. Specifically, we were able to distinguish between high-grade glioma, low-grade glioma, and other types of samples and pathologies with 87% accuracy. We believe adding gene expression data from other sources can further improve these representations. Throughout this development process, we met with our mentors on a weekly basis to get their insights and feed feedback. We would like to thank all of them for their help throughout the entire process. Awesome. Well done, Team American. Feel free to come off mute to answer any questions. And Team Activity or Team 14, you are up next. Uh, but any questions for Team American? Maybe I'll start. I'll start off, Deepak. I uh, see you are on team. Um, what is the next? Uh, do you guys have an incubation plan, or you? Um, what What is the next move on on this analysis? Thank you, Salvo. So this time, we, we, since we did not have the uh, treatment information, we were not able to add this into our uh, network. So our next incubation plan is uh, first use it in treatment information to uh, figure out if we can use that, uh, if we can recommend a treatment for similar type of patients. Uh, then we also want to uh, expand uh, these representation on a different type of tumors. Uh, we are already uh, working with CTF and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to ingest uh, more data set related to NF patients and other uh, rare tumors. Um, and then uh, there is also another plan where we, we want to uh, incorporate other uh, patient and tumor specific features like uh, tumor site, uh, on, onset, onset uh, age, uh, et cetera, where we can improve these uh, gene representation, gene and tumor sample representations. Thank you. My understanding is that, and very limited understanding, is that um, graph neural networks are really only going to work well if you have very good connectivity data between all of the nodes. Is there a reason to believe that you've got good data there? You know, the, is that data well scrubbed? You know, to me, intuitively, it would seem like there's um, a, a lot of probably holes in that data. Thank you. So we are using data from Open PBTA. It's a, a, a open source uh, science initiative where uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and other researchers in this uh, 
pediatric uh, tumor community are working on uh, creating or uh, creating a data source and we are using that uh, data source we were in touch with them uh, throughout this uh, whole process we were meeting them every week to discuss uh, the data set and we are uh, uh, pretty confident that uh, this data is already clean uh, they they assured us with that and uh, when we are incorporating new data set we are going to be working with them through the open pvta uh, on our github page we have the link of their open pvta uh, github repository or you can just google open pvta and you can see that there are uh, uh, more than uh, about more than 100 uh, contributors to that repository who are working on create uh, creating that uh, good data source. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Awesome, well done Team American. So up next, I have Team 14 with Aptivity and Bootstrap Paradox, you will be up next. Uh, so for Team 14, I will be playing this one in YouTube since it already has the captions integrated and here we go. Today, we'd like to introduce Activity, a simple solution to help patients and doctors coordinate and organize at-home treatment activities. Adam inspired us to bring a solution to patients with NF2. The problem is patients like Adam need to coordinate a number of therapies, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Adam's dream is to find a way to manage all of these demands and still be able to engage in his personal and professional commitments. NF2 affects patients in multiple and complex ways. For example, most people lose hearing in one or both ears. They also develop spinal tumors, which can lead to a wide range of issues and also have issues with vision. Because of complexities like this, coordinated care is critical to patient success. Looking at my schedule, between work, school, and my personal life, I am pretty overwhelmed, and I'm afraid that I'll prioritize the wrong treatment choices that can impact the management of my condition. We created an easy-to-use app that will allow patients to list all of their activities of multiple providers. Here we see activities of occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech therapists. The app will allow me and other patients to then share my treatments with my providers, to then evaluate all the options and weigh in on what makes more sense according to my patient needs at this moment in my treatment. Activity will then take advantage of machine learning based optimization, where it balances practice time with still allowing a personal life and a hectic schedule. So now there's a clear path for me from managing my care to also balancing a personal life. Is who benefits from this? Or who's going to pay for all this? Our business model will be focused on insurance companies. The benefit to the overall healthcare system will come with an increased adherence to treatment, as long as it, which will reduce year in and year out therapy sessions. It will also improve the data sharing process between patients and providers, which can bring better understanding <coughs> of patients' needs and a reduced need for expensive doctor appointments. The baseline was an app already in use in Brazil and also available in English, then to be customized with the input from Adam as a patient and mentor. A key differentiator for our app is that it presents minimal privacy or regulatory issues because we are not sharing medical records or asking doctors for unsolicited advice. Our team brings diversity and experience from patients to software developers to practicing clinicians. Thank you very much. 
Awesome. Well done, Team 14. Uh, if you are here and ready to answer questions, you can come off mute or answer them in the chat. Um, but yes, now we'll take any questions. And as a reminder, Bootstrap Paradox, you are up next. Uh, any questions for Team 14? Uh, how do you, how does the team envision that a doctor's interaction? I, so I see that you sh they showed a doctor's screen, but is it that the doctor would have a web-based inter interaction tool, or how would you, how is that envision um, how that that communication would happen? Sure. So I think it could be either web-based, or they could also download their own version of the app, and then it would be extremely simple in that the patient would just push their list of activities to the doctor, and the doctor will just rank the importance or the weight of each activity. So whether it's web-based, whether it's that they have the app, um, it would involve minimal need for input or effort from the doctors. Does that answer your question? Or? Yes, it does, yep. Okay. Great. Awesome. Any last questions for Adam and team 14? Uh, and otherwise, we'll move on to Bootstrap Paradox. But any last questions? Awesome. Great work, Adam and team 14. Now we will go to Bootstrap Paradox. And up next after that will be team Medbot. Hello, we are Team Bootstrap Paradox. Our team develops AI solutions for neurofibromatosis or NF. NF are genetic disorders that cause tumors to grow on nerve tissue. NF tumors may be benign or malignant. There isn't a reliable way to predict if a tumor will be benign or malignant. Our solution is an artificial intelligence model that uses genomics, imaging, clinical, and demographics data to predict if an NF tumor will be benign or malignant. The global NF treatment market is estimated to be $8 billion in 2020. The forecasted compound annual growth rate is 13.4% during 2020 to 2027. Our direct competitors are NF research organizations such as Erasmus Medical Center. Indirect competitors are NF drug manufacturers such as AstraZeneca. Our differentiation is we aim to translate basic NF research to clinical applications. Our product will be developed with non-dilutive funding such as grants. We will partner with NF research organizations to sell our product to drug manufacturers and treatment centers. Our business model is offer the predictive AI model to NF drug manufacturers and treatment centers. Initially, we will use research grants, such as SBIR, STTR from the U.S. government, to fund product development. Our product roadmap begins with genetic analysis of NF tumors at Phase 1. At Phase 2, we will enhance our analytics model with deep learning and more data. At Phase 3, we will scale the deep learning model as a product. Our diverse team consists of a medical doctor, a data scientist, and a software engineer. Each member has proven expertise within their fields. Thank you for your time, and don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. Awesome. Great work, Team Bootstrap Paradox. Uh, if you're here, you're welcome to come off mute and answer any questions. Uh, and one note, like I mentioned, Medbot will be up next. Uh, but any questions for Bootstrap Paradox? Hi, this is Dr. Nan, and a uh, very nice, uh, interesting project. Uh, I'm a researcher, I'm not a clinician, but I, I know a little bit about this kind of um, disease progression. From a benign to malignant, it's a very hot topic in the research. But however, uh, people or even clinicians, they, they cannot catch the transition stage. Uh, but, you know, since this, this transition stage is still blurred, um, for those plants from your fibro or benign tumor that slowly progression, some of those information you collected maybe keep non changed. You know, uh, how can you so sure you know to capture this uh, this kind of a uh, you know benign or, or malignant you know stage? So I just want to uh, you be slightly more specific. Um. 
Yeah, so I'm actually um, not a medical expert on the team. Uh, I'm a software engineer, actually. But um, we've actually looked at the similar work done on, say, like a breast cancer. And what they've done is actually they've used the imaging data and looked at the, the measurements of the tumors, for example, and built uh, some kind of a model to, um, to, to classify if that, um, whether that tumor is a benign or malignant. And so we're thinking actually uh, combining um, the imaging as well as the other data like the genomics, as I mentioned. Um, so we're, we're not just looking at, at one data, but we'll want to look at the several to try and, and classify the, the tumor. Awesome. And there's one other question in the chat, Don, that I want to make sure you're able to do, uh, get a chance to answer from Nick. He says, won't you need a very large amount of data to train your neural network with any level of accuracy? Yeah. Um, so most likely it will have to be done um, as a kind of a clinical trial. Um, where we would um, capture um, the Im imaging as well as the uh, genomics data along with the clinical data, and we would um, feed all those all, all the data into the, the model to build the, the initial model. Does that answer the question? Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Team Bootstrap Paradox. Uh, up next, we have Team Medbot. And after that, will be Team Zarloho to end us in uh, track one. But here is Team Medbot. Warm regards. We are Team Medbot and we present our innovation solution for the in silico screening of therapeutic molecules for neurofibromatosis 2 vestibular schwannomas. Neurofibromatosis 2 is a highly debilitating multiple tumor syndrome. Bilateral vestibular schwannomas are the fourth most common intracranial tumor facing substantial morbidity and reduced life expectancy with limited benefits from surgery and radiotherapy and no currently FDA-approved drug therapy and without sustained remission with off-label drugs like bevacizumab. Coupled with the already lengthy, complex, and costly process of de novo drug development, high attrition rates, and multiple targets involved in disease pathogenesis further makes the problem difficult. And therefore, it is imperative to recognize and meet the unmet need of a faster, more cost-effective process for the screening of molecules for further research and development. And that is why Team Megabot proposes the innovation solution of a machine learning model for the in silico screening of drugs for shortlisted neurofibromatosis 2 targets. And our model would involve the ranking of drug target pairs based on machine learning predicted drug target binding affinity. We aim to ref refine our model by using the alpha fold protein three dimensional structure database and validate our model by testing it on neurofibromatosis target and drug pairs currently under phase two clinical trials. And our model would essentially allow for the effective prioritization of molecules for further clinical studies and expedite phase two trials for safety proven drugs, thereby expediting the drug development process. Why our solution is unique is because by considering a regression problem and by modeling drug properties, it has the potential to provide accurate and indicative measures for infinite drug target combinations and predict the few important properties of suitable drug molecules, building a robust in silico machine learning screening model. And in post hackathon implementation phase, we plan to approach the Children's Tumor Foundation for the in vitro testing of the generated list of molecules based on our model. And if the results are favorable, advocate for the implementation of our model in pharmaceutical drug repurposing. And we hope that you will support us in this endeavor of using technology in healthcare as a small step in the fight against neurofibromatosis too. Thank you.
Awesome. Well done, Team Medbot. Feel free to come off mute to answer any questions. And Zarlojo, you will be up next. But any questions for Team Medbot? And there's a few already in the chat. Uh, if anyone from Medbot would like to come off mute and uh, start answering. So um, can we have any of the questions? So we have one question. Have you prototyped any of this for the actual data? Yes, we have prototyped uh, this. We have a uh, code and we've used data sets which uh, are on our Synapse project page. Um, We've used uh, the Kiba, uh, we've used the data set of drugs. Uh, Pranav or Shikich, if you're here, would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, so basically, uh, the collection of the data set was uh, one of the major part of our implementation. We uh, have not included just one data set, but we have included multiple data set and created a combined data set. We have considered one data set just for uh, the drugs, that is uh, the very famous Chembel data set, as, as well as we have also considered the PDB bind data set, as well as uh, for the base of our data set, we have considered David and Kiba data set. Awesome. I, have one question. I have one question, Lucas. So <clears throat> you, in your model, you presented, you said you're going to, um, you know, use a model that binds to the NF2 protein. Um, patients with NF2, uh, they miss the NF2 protein. So most of the drugs work on, let's say, downstream or uh, other targets that, you know, that kind of work as, as, as a, you know, on the manifestations. Of, of the disease. So how is your approach taking that into consideration? Uh, thank you for that question, sir. Actually, uh, our model um, does not include um, the drug binding to the NF2 protein. Uh, so what we've done is we've shortlisted a list of NF2 targets based on uh, the current available literature on disease packaging, which includes the mTOR C1 protein and the Merlin gene, as well as other downstream targets. Um, um, and then we have um, prepared a model that can uh, consider the binding of drugs to those particular downstream targets um, and then training our data set using that. So not considering the NF2 protein per se. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much to Team Medbot. And now we will move on to Zarlojo. They will be the last uh, video that we'll play for track one, which means up next is track two, Team Mighty Chondrias. Uh, so here is our last video for track one. When a patient is newly diagnosed with a rare disease, they are often overwhelmed at the number of different treatments they may need and how to synchronize treatment. That is why we invented Sarloho. Sarloho is an online platform that will help connect neurofibromatosis patients to relevant information over the course of their disease. With a multi-way platform, healthcare workers and patients will work together to specialize treatment based on the patient's symptoms that occur as they appear. Here's how it works. By using existing data and research, our data mining and programming team has collected a bank of relevant information on NF. This information will be collected and tagged with patient-friendly language. A patient will be connected to the interface via the web and allowed to log in and start tracking their journey. In the event that they experience a new symptom, they can log the first time and day that they recognize the symptom. With live time tracking at the start of a patient's new symptomatic event, Sarloho will be able to help the patients team with their doctors to seamlessly add any treatments to their treatment plan, no matter where they are on the journey, target which event to do first, and have the best clinical support throughout the whole journey. Additionally, with these tags, providers can locate relevant and helpful information that matches the patient's input to be released back to the patient that the patient may need to understand where they are in the course of their disease to be with organizing and prioritizing their treatment plan. Rare diseases change over time, and we get that. Zorro is built to be powered by machine learning to expand and accommodate the intricacies that come with rare disease. You might ask, what about privacy and regulations? Zorlo is equipped to be compliant with the rules and regulations regarding health data in each state and country of use. Zorlo will not sell patient information, and all data and collected information will only be released to the secure system by consent of the patient. Any information added to the system with consent will also be de-identified and put into a database to advance and specialize NF research and treatment. 
Zarlolo will be free for patients and providers, and the interface will be provided to hospitals and NF care centers through a secure online portal. When we evaluate the market of healthcare apps, specifically synchronizing treatment and giving patients access to relevant data that concerns their disease, one online interface comes to mind. TeamScope is a data collection app for clinical and field research. Doctors and family members can monitor the data remotely as patients log habits or symptoms. While TeamScope is accessible for symptom tracking, it costs money, which excludes patients that cannot afford the fees. Further, TeamScope is not built to help target care for rare disease patients. But with Zaloho, our mission is to make a rare disease interface for rare disease patients, to organize, specialize, and customize their care, while also connecting the patients with their distinct team of doctors and data. Zaloho stands alone with our singular mission being to unite information, patient efficacy, and provider support to patients living with NF. Because with Zaloho, patients are working in tandem with their disease and with their doctor. And why not? Zaloho, because two are better than one. Awesome. Well done, team. If the judges have any questions, feel free to come off mute or type them in the chat. And up next will be Team Mighty Chondrias. The app take into account if something's recommended as a uh, course of care, uh, the result. So is there, is it just managing the course of care and directing it, or is there a, a, a feedback area where they can add in that this course of care was successful, not successful, and that sort of thing? We'd hope that with the way everything goes and tracks and the patient mentioning in that tracking system um, that they are going to receive this treatment, that as they go along their journey, if it doesn't work or if it does work, they'll also mention that as they log it. Through. So that, yes, there will be feedback, not from the system, but from the patient saying, hey, this worked for me or it didn't. And that will totally be collected through and logged as data into the database. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions before we move on to track two? All right, thank you so much, Team Zarloho. And like I said, now we are on to track two. And first up is Team Mitochondrias. And after that will be Hack for Patients. Hello, everyone. We are Team Mitochondrias presenting you Telephonics. John H2 is diagnosed with PHTS, shows therapeutic delays, and is non communicable. Parents find it hard to manage their appointment as well as performance day to day case at home. About 25% of children born with P10 mutation are autistic and often have difficulties with communication. Statistical data on ESD reveals 1% of the world population, 1 in 60 births in the US, and 1 in 89 children between 2 and 9 suffer from ESD according to AIMS. We have designed an app for children diagnosed with ASD in PHTS to track the symptoms to aid them in verbal communication, cognition, and motor skills through musical elements such as rhythm, melody, and tempo. It will also help parents to appoint for plan appointments and also for doctors to track the symptoms and patient progress. Telephonics benefits for children's mental and physical health by engaging with various musical activities to improve their communication and interaction skills. Parents will benefit by setting the appointments and doctors can monitor the patient disease progression. Our key features include musical cue cards, helps the children to sit, stand, walk, and crawl. Such activity will help in strength, balance, range of motion by auditory rhythm to facilitate movement. Exercises where the music uses shapes uh, to facilitate passive mouth position for ya, yeah, no, oo. Escalate words in high and low pitches will help them with their fluency articulation by using music and singing to verbalize the plan, pain, and feelings. Cognitive activities like med rhythms and picture memories facilitate memory recall, enhance learning, and improve attention. Next, we have a planner to reduce the stress of planning appointments for parents to schedule color coded appointments. The application will notify and remind medication and record dosage over a time period. They can also store relevant notes for further purposes. 
Telephonic falsi enables the parents to list and track symptoms, classify stimulation by taking pictures of them and monitor overall progress. Doctors can track child progress, provide feedback, monitor updates. They can be achieved to provide a clear patient history. These are some of our competitors. Telephonic stands unique in such a way that it follows certain characteristics benefit for patient, parent, and doctors. We have a symptom tracker, appointment planner, activities all in one platform. It's cost friendly and user friendly. Using our app, the patient records are secure. Cost structure for telephonic specify platform development, maintenance, technical development, R&D, IT, marketing, admin, legal and profession services. Our next step will be to collaborate and create prototype, highly study, feature modification, app development, and final releases. I am Aparthi Lakshmi Narayanan, my team member Divya Balakrishnan. We can be a thanks to Dr. Thomas Fisher and Christian Anthony. Awesome. Well done, team. Any questions for Team Mighty Chondrias? And as a reminder, Hack for Patients, you will be up next. Uh, but any questions for the team? All right, it looks like we don't have any questions. So good work, Team Mighty Chondrias. Oh, one question from Lisa Scheuer. Can you say again how this will sustain? Anyone from Team Mighty Chondrias that can answer? It doesn't look like anyone is from the team that can. Hello? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, um, we hope to, uh, uh, I really don't know how. In what aspect uh, the sustainability is uh, actually yet to be, uh, we just designed the idea for now. So we are yet to prototype and, you know, we have to uh, do our pilot study and uh, then proceed further. I don't, I, I can't really answer the sustainability currently. Awesome, no worries. And any other questions for Team Mighty Chondrias? All right, good work team. And then up next we have Hack for Patients. And after that, we will have Med Kronos. So here is Hack for Patients. Hello, we are the Hack for Patients team. Today, we will share the story of Jennifer. Jennifer is a superhero. With the pandemic, many finally realize how teachers are critical in our society. She has been managing kids virtually and adapting to the new model. She has been amazed how things have changed or almost everything. Since her diagnosis 15 years ago, Jennifer has seen changes in the healthcare space, yet she's overwhelmed trying to coordinate her care. It is more complex than managing her class with 15 kids screaming all together but she needs to manage over 20 specialist appointments and her medical data. Jennifer might have a rare condition, yet she's not alone. 30 million people are estimated to have a rare disease in the US and 20% of all diagnosed cancers are considered rare. The speed we've seen to develop the COVID vaccine had never happened for any rare disease. We are bringing a solution that is centered on Jennifer's needs, helping the coordination of her circle of care all while contributing to her disease registry. Our solution combines an app already available in Brazil with the feedback from mentors, patients' presentations, and the work of our team. Bright Stripes helps Jennifer to organize appointments, store data, and share her story with her providers. Empowering patients to share their stories and needs are key to transform the story of many more. Jennifer has already seen an improvement on her quality of life. She feels more confident and more prepared when heading to her next appointment. All the topics she wants to discuss with her providers are organized in one place, from her medication to the last test result, or a little note about that unusual pain while walking her dog. 
more importantly, Jennifer feels empowered to talk about her own treatment goals. Our app must be a solution for many more. We know the importance of access and equity. We will offer the app in partnership with patient organizations, but also available to individuals who might not be members. As we progress, data can be shared to support treatment development through ethical partnership with biotech industries. From testing to connecting to the registries, we want to serve patients like Jennifer. We identified few apps such as cancer.net or we cancer as potential competitors, yet we believe our main advantage is the fact that we listen to patients and mentors and our ability to integrate with registries. Our team comes with passion, experience, and diversity. We are combined patient advocate, product design, an entrepreneur with rare disease expertise, and a pediatrician, all mentored by a great group of experts. From Singapore, Brazil, India, and the US, we are committed to make a better world for people with rare diseases. Thank you. Awesome. Well done, Team Hack for Patients. Uh, do any of the judges have any questions? And up next will be Med Kronos. Uh, but any questions for Hack for Patients? Questions are welcome. Uh, feel free to type in the chat as well. Can you, um, Aichip, can you comment on how this app, and you already mentioned, differentiate from existing um, solutions that are now popping up on the web? Yeah, so I believe uh, uh, in the pitch, Simon mentioned about uh, cancer.net. Uh, we have looked into a few competitors as well. Most of them are catered to a wide range of patient information. There's no one uh, platform out there that's specifically catered for just uh, P10 tumor disease, which is, which is uh, the patients that we are trying to help uh, and helping them to navigate that complex uh, navigation of different uh, uh, service care providers and also the circle of care uh, to complete that uh, healthcare journey. We believe that the patient medical records and all the service providers should be in one place and should belong to the patient. So one of the things that we are trying to do is also allowing the patient to be able to export their patient data if they one day decided that they do no longer want to stay with the platform. And that would uh, be something that we want to empower the patients to do. Uh, once they have made up their mind. What would be the cost of a minimum viable product? Oh, but, um, so we have already the app fully developed and it's up and running in Brazil and it's available also in English. So it's a matter of adapting it to um, specific needs of the P10 community or any other specific uh, need that we can identify. That's why we started conversations with some of the, the patients groups to make sure that we can deliver what is needed for them to start using. And we do have plans as discussed also with them to apply eventually to SBIR funding. If we need to go deeper into development that are more specific for their needs. Great, thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Thanks for the question. Awesome, great work team. And up next we have Team Med Kronos. Hi, we're excited to share our product, Phenomap. Meet a patient, Jack. He's 11 years old, he was diagnosed with PHCS at age seven, but after a number of thyroid screenings was diagnosed with thyroid cancer at age 11. And clinicians are still trying to understand why. Like Jack, there are many PHCS patients who were or are at risk of having thyroid cancer, which could have been detected much earlier. And so clinicians want to know when they should remove a thyroid gland in these types of patients and how can they do so in an evidence-based patient-specific manner. So we came up with a data visualization tool to help clinicians um, come up with this decision by looking at the disease progression across different PHTS patients. So we developed a web-based application that integrates 
with the Peaton Foundation Patient Registry. And so clinicians can look at an individual patient and compare to other um, PHTS patients in the cohort and also filter across different clinical features. As we can see here, we can look at one single patient and see their disease progression visually and see at certain ages in the future where they could have a higher risk of having um, thyroid cancer. So we looked across the market and, and saw competitors, but not direct competitors that focused on PHCS patients and focused on thyroid cancer risk. Therefore, we really see value in building this clinician-facing tool that really helps to um, clearly visualize all of the patient-generated data that is um, particular to this patient population. So even though um, we're focused on a clinician-facing tool, we'll still need the information from the patient like Jack and their parents to fill out this questionnaire um, in the Peaton Foundation Patient Powered Registry, which will feed into the Phenomap visualizations to then help the clinician decide on whether to remove the thyroid gland. So the beauty of our solution is that it really adds to the suite of Peaton Foundation tools, such as the Patient Powered Registry. And in integrating, we would also be increasing the amount of um, data that is generated in the registry and fed into our um, Phenomap dashboard. So we're really focused on the PHCS patient population, but may expand further in the future, but our implementation costs will, um, will then require us to apply for um, NIH funding. As for future work, we'll be focused on data integration with the full registry um, database and then also feature selection. But this is our team that we've been working with together over the past couple of weeks. And thank you to all of our mentors and other stakeholders. Awesome. Well done, team. If there are any questions from the judges, feel free to ask. And then up next will be exterminators for track three. Uh, but any questions from team uh, for team med chronos? Um, are you going to work with the patient community? What, if the, is the registry already collecting the data that you'd use for this to make the comparison, or is it something you're working with the patient community to update their registry? Yep, so I can take that question. Thank you. So um, we've been working, especially this past couple of weeks, with the Peaton Foundation, who already has their patient-powered registry, and they've already gone through a number of cycles of collecting data from the um, PHTS patients. So we would be integrate, integrating directly with um, that database. And I think that's really the clear value of this product so that we're not um, building up a whole new process of data collection. And yeah, I see another question here in the chat. Um, so we're confirming that Micronos had the data um, of the patient slash family puts into your app and goes into the re uh, patient, patient registry. Yes. So yes, um, similar um, question, but yes, we would be integrating um, directly. And so that's why we want to continue our relationship with the foundation. Um, and I think given our exper expertise within our team, we also have um, we also have some clinical informatics expertise, just to understand how to actually properly link um, the clinical features um, into our app and then properly, um, um, properly visualize given the HIPAA compliances. Awesome, great work team Med Kronos. And up next we have Extuminators. And then after that, we will move on to Team Psych Network. So this is our first track, uh, first video rather for track three. And here we go. Hello, my name is uh, Griffin Dunn. I'm a research technologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And today I'll be telling you a little bit about our project. Um, so. The main idea of our project is that we leveraged NF1 drug screen data for Newman syndrome drug target discovery. Um, this is for the Rosopathies Challenge track, and my team member is Dao Chun San. So before this hackathon, I never really knew anything about Rosopathies or any of the more rare conditions affiliated with this event. Um, upon doing some research into these conditions, I noticed that there's a very limited amount of data and models for Newman syndrome. I talked with my team member, Dao Chun, about this, and he mentioned one of his past projects where he created a drug screen of NF1 models using conserved networks of placed form neurofibroma models. 
we thought that we could use the same thinking, but with NF1 models and Noonan syndrome. We thought that to overcome the limited models of Noonan syndrome, we could use the drug screen of NF1 models to identify drug targets of Noonan syndrome and NF1. This would allow us to determine different drug candidates based on which of them target these conserved networks. Okay, so we used networks of plexiform neurofibroma cells and networks of induced pluripotent stem cells from Noonan syndrome patients to identify conserved gene regulation networks. Using these conserved networks, along with drug response data, we can identify gene ontology enrichment into different drug clusters. These annotated drug clusters include the known gene and drug target. We then performed a semantic analysis to measure similarity or distance from multiple GEO terms. This helped us narrow down the drugs that target certain clusters. We were then able to rank the different combinations and select the top candidates. These top candidates should have a good chance to help reduce the phenotype of Noonan syndrome. Okay, so some benefits of our strategy include using induced pluripotent stem cells from Noonan syndrome patients. This is very beneficial because it most closely resembles a patient and is a very good model to resemble Newman syndrome. We were also able to use the results of a flexworm neurofibroma drug screen to overcome the lack of data of Newman syndrome. We identified the conserved gene networks between flexiform neurofibromas and Newman syndrome. Uh, these drug targets can potentially inhibit the shared signaling in both Drosophilus disorders. This strategy allowed us to have an actionable drug candidate list for Noonan syndrome to reduce or control the phenotype with the limited Noonan syndrome data and models. Also, we can further verify and evaluate different drug combinations according to these drug candidates. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge the organizers of this event and acknowledge the encouragement of data sharing and collaboration that occurred throughout this event. It helped create a sort of community aspect to the hackathon um, I would also like to acknowledge our two mentors, Tuesday Dyer and Sangri, for all they were able to help us with throughout the process. Awesome. Well done, team. Uh, if there's any questions from the judges, feel free to ask. And as a reminder, Team Psych Network, you will be up next. Uh, but any questions from the judges for the exterminators? Oh, I'm not a judge, but can I ask a question? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so you were um, looking at Noonan syndrome based on iPS cells. Can you potentially also apply this to the other rasopathies? Um, and sort of keep building up the data? Yeah, theoretically, yes. Um, we try to actually, at the very beginning, try to expand, but I searched other Noonan syndrome, oh, sorry, other rasopathies don't have very well, you know, Establish the model of well characterized transcript transcriptome, you know, for us to take advantage. And the Nolan syndrome for this one, uh, they they have very good, you know, IPSC developed from the patient directly, which can uh, just for us to you know identify the conserved you know network. But uh, for sure, with uh, you know in the future, if uh, more data build up in the rasopsis, we want to apply this strategy to identify you know the common uh, or reserved drug target for rasopsis. Thank you. Awesome. And one other question in the chat before we move on: Did you find any interesting novel drug candidates? Anything you want to try out? Uh, we do uh, actually. If, uh, we checked us. Uh, the last slides we do uh, have a top 10 ranked uh, candidates uh, but the challenge part is uh the, the model what is a good model uh, we don't have those uh, ipsc cells uh, uh, available at hands and uh, and uh, it's a uh, it's it's could be challenge you know uh, that to to you know really verify them in a battle lab but uh, well, we are definitely actively thinking uh, to get the models or how to handle this in the future, yeah, steps. Awesome, great work team, exterminators. So up next is team Psych Network and after that will be Rasso players. So here is Psych Network. I'm David Krishna representing team Psych Network. And today we'll be pitching Level Up an interactive application to assess overall development of rasopathy's children. 
As a team, the problem that we have sought out is a higher prevalence of cognitive and learning disabilities found through evidence in various degrees in the risopathies and a clear lack of a tracking system to assimilate these variations and store them for future reference. Now, this can be easily understood through this following graph, where you can clearly see a changing range of cases of cognitive impairment factorized by age, genetic mutations, etc. And there is no automated system to track these variations in developmental milestones. Hence, we propose a solution consisting of four stages. First, we develop an interactive milestone tracker application for children, which will provide feedback assessment of the children's developmental growth. Now, these assessments can be stored in a backend development database or a patient registry, which can be useful for doctors, researchers, and parents of newly diagnosed children for future reference. Now, these are a few screenshots of the uh, project sample, which we created over these few days, and this is the backend database. So how are we different from the conventional applications we have today? So this is a sample of a milestone tracker developed by CDC, which is basically a parent questionnaire where a parent fills answers for the children and taken in a parent point of view. So how we are different is that we are taking a child-based approach. We will be using animations, games, etc., to extract the answers and the assessment details from the children so that we have more authentic reports and there is no chance of any bias of any sort. Now, this is our business model. Our business model, we have the target clients as the guardians and parents of children with risopathies, and our target collaborators are Risopathies Network and CFC International. We have three plans. In the initial months, we will be focusing on creating the patient database and the patient registry, and we will be allowing free analytic usage. And after debugging and testing, we will have two subscription plans of one of a basic and advanced, which will be different based on the features which we will provide. We are Team Psych Network, and thank you for listening to our pitch. Bye. Awesome. Great work, Team Psych Network. Uh, any questions from the judges and Rasso players, you will be up next. Is there, um, how did you take into account um, the regression or, or when they, you're meeting milestones or milestones are lost due to um, interventions like treatments or, or um, drugs? Okay, so um, I'm inferring, I'm thinking your question is about how do we assess the milestones of the children based, what is the model behind it? Is that your question, ma'am? No, uh, so in, in development, when a model or severe uh, development is affected, where the milestones either are reached and then they are, they lose them for different reasons, but whether it be the, the progression of the disorder and or treatments. So, the when they go on a medication, maybe they'll lose a milestone. Is that something that you're taking into account? Uh, not right now, exactly. So, uh, exactly. So, in our model we have a feedback uh, assessment plan. So in a feedback assessment plans, we'll have fixed values of targets to be reached by children. And then we will extract the target with the child has reached. And then we assess the difference between the target of the child and the, um, the child and the target to be reached. And we will um, pipeline this particular assessment to the therapist uh, of that particular child who's right now treating the child. So in this, so through our feedback assessment um, system, the therapist of the child will get to know what exactly is the status of the child's milestone. Is the, is, uh, so suppose uh, that child reached X milestone at age three and maybe at age five, he or she has still not reached that milestone. That means the therapy with the child is right now um, taking into account is not really working maybe. So we are, taking, uh, we are taking that point of view where we will be just having a fixed value and we will check the difference between the, uh, the input and the uh, fixed value and we will be pipelining it to the therapist so that they can find out the 
what exactly is the status of the child on a continuous basis? I hope that answers your question, ma'am. Awesome. Great work, Team Psych Network. Up next, we have Rasso players, and after that, it will be track pain. So here is Rasso players. A unified approach towards explaining the Rasso players featuring the team Rasso players. We, the Rasso players, aim to provide reliable basics to screen Rasso players in children. Our approach is based on social skills and uh, psychological studies. In the first goal, the things coming to your mind might be a series of complex tests and questionnaires for a team of trained physicians observing the child and his social interactions. Seems pretty obvious, right? But what if it can be fun? So, we bring you a cheap gamified approach for the detection of rasopathies. And how do we do that? So, digging deep into it, According to a study conducted in 2018, most of the social skill tests when evaluated pairwise fail to provide a convincing half plane of classification. But when the same data is mapped in a multidimensional setup, has the ability to provide standard classification of the subjects. Thus, using the this domain of knowledge about the subject-specific tests and general interaction of children with the environment allows us to encapsulate the test into Number of kids, the games capture the specific nature of child and the interactions generating the school for a specified trait. The level of difficulty is regulated at intervals to obtain a more accurate evaluation. In the last steps, since it's rather difficult to say that a trait child is observed in a child, we create a sparse matrix representation of the children with the trait observed and use the inductive matrix completion to obtain a prominent pattern observed in each child. Since uh, the conclusion is explicitly based on a gameplay, the virtual interaction, the required results can be obtained in a short span of time with minimum requirements in terms of equipment and expertise. A business plan consists of stakeholders uh, having customer segment, that is final consumer, radius organization, hospitals, and institution, and revenue streams like government hospitals, institutions, organizations, and NGOs. The roadmap for our project has been for five months, month one, while to validate the tune features and games with the help of doctors and standard test. Month two, testing this game on cohorts, uh, different cohort sizes. Month three, train the larger models from the obtained data and capture the interferences. Month four, extraction features from other medical tests and append them to our approach for a complete expert experience. Month five, get involved to the integral part of the healthcare system, develop the rest of the games and record parameters towards the top of the screen. This is our team members. Thank you for listening. Awesome, great work to team Rasso players. Uh, any questions from the judges and track pain, you will be up next. Uh, Lucas, there is, I think, a question, a couple of questions in the chat. Yes, one, uh, if anyone from Team Rasso players can answer, uh, someone says, is this app created to diagnose RAS syndromes or to diagnose neuropsychiatric comorbidities in RAS syndromes? Uh, anyone from the team able to answer? It looks like we don't have anyone from Rasso players, um, but we'll copy and paste those questions and get them sent over. Uh, so up next is team track pain. And then I have a couple more for track three that aren't in my little file here, uh, but track pain, you are up next. And then for care, you will be after that for your third track submission. So here is track pain. Hello everyone. This is Team Trap Pain. To start with the presentation, I'd like to tell you the story of my 10-year-old friend, Max. He was diagnosed with Noonan syndrome when he was two years old, and he frequently experienced chronic and acute muscle pain in his legs. Sometimes the pain used to occur after walking, and sometimes while laying down. 
Max suffered from sleep deprivation from the unbearable pain. At the age of six, a deterioration in his neurological state occurred, after which he became unable to communicate his pain status to his caregivers. His parents are now concerned about his quality of life as they are unable to tell when he is in pain and when he is not in pain. Patients who are non-communicative suffer from a massive reduction in the quality of life. This is a widely prevalent problem since about 50 to 63% of the Azapathy patients suffer from acute pain. Track pain is one of its kind wearable device which tracks acute pain experienced by Azapathy patients. Pain affects the autonomic nervous system of the patient and hence affects various measurable physiological markers of the ANS response which is captured and analyzed by the device. The solution has three parts. The first part of the solution, the device is capable of measuring heart rate, respiratory rate, skin conductivity, and actigraphy through the sensors placed on the chest and wrist, which enables real-time monitoring and recording. It is powered by the Raspberry Pi for the prototype version. This is the circuit of the powered wearable device consisting of the blood pulse volume sensor, an ECG, an actinometer, and an LCD screen to show the instructions to be followed. The second part is a mobile app which will help to track the pain episodes and collect patient data. Using this patient obtained data, a casual network will analyze the physiological data patterns of the pain, which will help in generating the trained casual patient network. While the patient is wearing the device and they start experiencing pain, they have to press the record pain button. Once it is pressed, the app starts labeling all physiological readings it records with the label of under pain. After the pain attack is finished, they interact with a mobile app that administers a visual analog pain scale, which is self-reported and a mechanical question. The third part of our solution is an inference algorithm. For children who are communicative and are willing to give their feedback through the phone app, the real-time biological data is recorded. The data is then uploaded to an anonymous database to create a Bayesian network to study the relationships between parameters shown on this slide. This network will help to predict pain scores in non-communicative patients using the existing causal relationships between pain scores and sensor data. Finally, notifications can then be sent to caregivers in real time, informing that the patient is under acute pain. We plan to take this product to the market based on the following business model. Our device is a novel approach to measure pain in resopathy patients. Some smartwatches can also measure physiological parameters, but none of which correlate to pain or is usable for resopathy patients. For future scope, we would like to make the device more compact and ergonomic. Eventually, our goal is to manufacture the device in a non-Raspberry Pi dependent environment. Thank you so much for your attention. Awesome. Well done to the team. Are there any questions for Team Track Pain from the judges? And then up next will be for care. Uh, but any questions for Track Pain? Um, one question is, is, is this app, um, can this app be tailored for other syndromes that actually suffer from acute pain or other type of pain? And do you also um, envision a validation with uh, normal ways of tracking pains like questionnaire that are used for clinical trials? Um, I can uh, take that one. So, so in our app, we, what we are doing is we're basically administering a questionnaire after the event of the pain occurs. So uh, when the pain event occurs, the, the, all the physiological parameters are recorded. And after the pain event ends, the person is administered a questionnaire, which we are basically using two kinds of questionnaires. One is the standard uh, gold standard, which is basically a pain scale, uh, a facial expression pain scale. And the other is a McGill pain scale, which is a bit more subjective, uh, but also has a bit more research backing it. And yes, it can be used for, uh, it can be expanded to include other conditions uh, which cause acute pain. Okay. Awesome. If there's no other questions for track pain, up next is for care. Uh, the video is a little bit long, so I will have to cut it at three minutes. Uh, and then after for care, we will have one more from track three. Uh, Yinning, if you are listening, it will be your presentation. Uh, but here is for care. We are for care a platform that helps caregivers manage their medical imaging and reports for their loved ones during their care journey. So just a bit of background. 
Epic, for example, has you know an all one place platform for people to get access to their reports, as well as a reminder kind of appointment scheduling system. However, talking to the caregivers, uh, we found that a lot of them have binders to manage their care. So then that makes us question, you know, why why have these systems not not worked? And why are patients or caregivers carrying DVDs of images? So, you know, our target population, especially that we want to focus on is mothers because they have, you know, among their work, they also have to care for their children. Um, and, uh, you know, these medical reports are actually useful for clinical trials because if you have them, you could find, you know, if you have a collection of them, then it could speed the process of, uh, you know, maybe finding a more effective drug for that treatment, especially, you know, in rare disease populations when it's very critical. So, um, you know, going back to like, you know, working mothers, how they manage things. So Google Calendar has been a big uh, part of their uh, coordination. So our, uh, through our solution, we hope that, you know, we help them through that. And this is what we propose. So the first part of our uh, pipeline would be to allow patients, you know, to be advocate of their care by keeping track of their appointments. And they do so by adding it to their Google Calendar. And then they could, uh, you know, um, upload their information such as medical reports and imaging based on um, the various categories and specialists that they visit. And then this information could be shared, you know, with research institutions, foundations, especially the Rastafati Network to help them with their uh, coordination and care plan. So here's the solution that uh, we propose. So, uh, the uh, the patient or the caregiver logs in, and then they can access their uh, patient dashboard. And here you could see the upcoming appointments with the radiologist August second, so they could see the most recent one. And now they're adding something, uh, another appointment, right, at August first, uh, at a different time. That was recently booked through the healthcare system. So then they could see on their calendar, and that you know helps them kind of coordinate things. And then uh, they can upload files that they receive from their providers, you know, because sometimes it's not only a report that's not there, it's also image, right? An image is hard to read. And that's why, for example, uh, they're carrying those DVDs. So with our platform, we hope to have patients kind of track their records through that. Awesome. That's unfortunately all the time we have for the four care team, but you can, of course, watch their entire presentation on their project page. Uh, but any questions for the four care team and Yinning, uh, you are welcome to come off mute as you will be up next to present. Uh, but any questions for four care? Um, this model is quite, it's, it's similar to a couple other things in the space. Is there, did you already do a landscape of things that might be co potential com um, competitors to this? Um, yes, thanks, thanks, Vanessa. I think, uh, you know, we showed the uh, Epic. So my chart is one uh, application that has been used uh, that, you know, talking to patients, uh, they have been using it to keep track of their scheduling appointments and they could add it to their calendar. But where we come in is, uh, we kind of, we take that appointment, we, we have the patients actually upload their documents because Epic, for example, has, um, you know, maybe for example, if we take Cleveland Clinic and Vanderbilt Health uh, Clinic, they are integrated in Epic, but not all uh, institutions are integrated into the Epic system. You know, some local out of patient uh, clinics are not there and imaging data is also not included. So what we hope to leverage with our system is a kind of a patient driven, system where they could actually upload their own documents and keep track of them because most of the caregivers right now are actually still using uh, you know these binders and carrying the information there and printing it out um, so that's where uh, you know we kind of stand out there and what about the portability of that so if they upload it are they able to resend it to a different provider or what have what is the kind of the, the feature of that data once it's been uploaded to that is it just for the patient usage or patient family usage or is it past that yeah, that's a good question. So um, in terms of sharing data, so let's say after they, they upload the medical reports, uh, we can have inferences uh, from these, for example, you know, with uh, 
if you if you take NF, for example, they have like tumors, so we can extract that information from the medical reports. But uh, going back to like the sharing aspect of things, so if we want to share it, we would uh, share it with like um, providers through an API, uh, and that would be encrypted, just ensure security, and uh, you know we'll avoid those um, personal uh, health information, right? Like uh, their name and uh, birth dates, we won't have those kind of included. And, and that's, you know, so, so the stakeholders would be providers, but also uh, foundations, right? So uh, especially with Rastafathy, right, there's a Costella and other foundations like CFC. So we could share it with them too. And, you know, they could add it to their portal. And right now, if you look at the registries, they're all, you know, form-based. There's no actual medical reports that are added to them. And you know that's also applicable to the PTEN Foundation and the uh, CTF Foundation because medical reports have, have not been shared there. So um, you know that's where we would stand out on a, on a niche market there. Awesome, great work, Dana. And we do need to move on. We have two presentations left. Um, so for our next one, Yinning, if you could come off of mute and confirm you're ready. We had some problems with his video, so he will present his live. Uh, but Yinning, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Awesome, let me pull up your PDF. And feel free to begin. Just as a reminder, I do have to time you. Uh, so whenever you start, I will start the timer and you'll go for three minutes. The challenges of limited number of patients with rare diseases, track three, as well as their precious specimen and the data unknown. The strength of our team made our effort to take the following five and global approach in three layers to meet these challenges. Layer one, multi, multi, uh, multi-discipline. It's an integrated approach of basic clinical and social sciences. Layer two, uh, layer two at the data science, we all know there are huge number at the different omics, proteo uh, proteomics, genomics, but we also need to integrate them together in the so-called panomics approach. Um, we're using um, traditional computer can help, but we likely will need to explore with quantum computer. The data is so huge, particularly when we address the e interaction among different huge omics. Layer three are at a level with three novel approaches, Ignite, Vision, and Music. Ignite is to improve communication. This came from my neighbor whose child was born with a severe autism. I can see how much her young boy want to communicate better with others and at the same time, the fear and the communication skills that he could improve. The Ignite approach came from my own experience to help kids in two age groups, age six and age 12. This is to help the kids to ignite their own desire to overcome the challenge and to improve their communication skills. Vision is to help to improve uh, uh, that was at uh, track three webinar, and I saw um, I saw so many kids on the slides wear wear glasses. That actually reminded my own challenge. I wear glasses when I was very young in grade school. The challenge that I had, you know, kids make fun of each other. I fully understand, but that at the same time, those vision vision challenge we should address as well. This came from when I'm getting older, then I'm using the, uh, you know, sort of fitness, but it's not like a skeletal muscle, you go to gym, but it's more specific on the, you know, for the vision. Of course, this will be for a limited, uh, for sub population of this patient, uh, you, know, of, uh, you know, of the patients. Music. That is three minutes, Yining, if you want to just wrap it up super quickly. Okay, music is to help, uh, came from, the, uh, my own ex commu community experience and also the first public and community, uh, first public initiative on music between 
Kennedy Center and, um, and a, a federal agency in Washington, DC. So I appreciate, uh, I thank your time. Awesome. And oh, hold on, I'm sorry, I do want to show the second slide. That shows the strength of my team. And I, won't, I understand I don't have time, so I won't take the time. Awesome. But, yeah. Thank you so much, Yining. But you and can leave the slide there, so if people have questions. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, as everyone, uh, so you know, you can watch their full video on the Synapse, uh, on their Synapse project. It was just a little bit too long to show. Uh, but any questions for Yining and his team before we move on to our last presentation? Awesome. If we don't have any questions, like I said, you can watch their full video on their Synapse project page. And without further ado, uh, we have our last track, track four. Uh, we have Team MCR. Uh, hello. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I speak? Hi, Siobhan. Yeah, go ahead before I start this so, video. Uh, yeah, sorry. So actually, we are from the uh, hack for uh, track three. We are from the Rasu players team. And I guess we missed, uh, we didn't have a, got a chance to present. Um, I did play your video and I will, there was one question from the chat that I will put in the chat for you to see so that you can respond it, uh, respond to it there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Do, do you need to, pre do we need to present it? Uh, no, because I, I already played your video. So I'll post that question okay. in the chat. And then um, here is our uh, last video from Team MCR for track four. Okay. Hello, we are Team MCR for the Hack for Rare competition presenting on desmoid tumors. Desmoid tumors are a rare tumor affecting 0.3% of all cancers. They typically do not metastasize. They can invade local tissues, exhibit aggressive growth, and have a high rate of recurrence. They typically do not cause death except when they involve vital structures. However, they can be painful and can considerably degrade quality of life. In this track, we're tracking an individual patient. It's a 36 year old female with a mass on her back. There is an 11 year period where this uh, tumor has been present. The past therapies have included non-pharmacological options such as surgery, ultrasound and radiation therapy. Pharmacological options have included NSAIDs and a variety of chemotherapies, including sorafenib, doxyl, and methotrexate. Uh, these have had uh, some degree of success. However, they've all had some side effects, and they're not good long-term options. The sequence of therapies this patient has followed has been conventional based on published literature. However, we're at the end of the conventional sequence of therapies, and we're now entering the investigational therapies area. So typically desmoid tumors are caused by a mutation of the CTNNB1 gene, which encodes for beta catenin protein. This is 85 to 95% of sporadic desmoid tumor cases. Uh, also associated is a mutation of the APC gene, which can be associated with familial adenomas polyposis. Dysregulation of this pathway leads to a, a nuclear accumulation of the beta catenin. So this patient does not have a mutation to CTNNB1 or APC. Um, however, they do have an accumulation of beta-catenin in the nucleus of the desmoid tumor cells. So there must be another cause for that. So we're looking at a, a variety of other signaling pathways, estrogen, mTOR, NOTCH, JAK, STAT, hedgehog, and KIT. And then for each of the pathways that we propose, we do have specific mechanisms in mind for how they can affect cancer and tumor growth. So we'll kind of jump through those real quick. Uh, ultimately, what we have though is a, a, theory, a, a series of suggestions for tests that the patient can take. So this is immunohistochemistry or real-time PCRs, checking for the presence of, of a variety of chemicals. And if the chemicals are present, they would indicate a certain therapy. So each of the pathways has a potential therapy uh, based on the testing um, that we present here. So past testing that has been done is the whole genome testing. And this is something we do recommend other patients also follow. Uh, however, we do recommend that if that is non-conclusive that we extend it to include the immunohistochemistry or the real-time PCR. These are the specific tests that we recommend for those solutions uh, to identify which pathways might be relevant. And here's a summary table showing the uh, individual drugs that might be relevant based on the results of those pathway tests. So upcoming, we would like the patient to undergo the testing we propose. 
We think that this patient would be a good candidate for a case report since they're a unique class of patient where conventional genetic mutations are not present. And long-term, we believe that other people could benefit from this as far as therapy selection when they also do not have the typical genetic mutations for desmoid tumors. Thank you very much. Awesome, great work. Uh, any questions for Team MCR? And we actually have one video left to play. Uh, I will pull it up in here just a moment for track one. Uh, but any questions for Team MCR before we get to our official uh, last video? Uh, there's one question in the chat. Have you not tested this patient and applied this protocol already? If so, what were outcomes and recommendations? Uh, anyone from team MCR able to answer? Yes. Um, so unfortunately, during the timeline of this event, we weren't able to get to um, all of the testing for these. Uh, however, it is part of a larger uh, timeline. Uh, this, this, it, it, the patient was pre-planned to have two phases. There was an investigation phase, then there was a data gathering phase. So we're actually just entering the data gathering phase, which will be uh, the continuation of this project with the medical team. Uh, we do have some information. Uh, the patient has shared their full medical history. So we do know some things like there's the beta catenin accumulation in the cell nucleus. Uh, and uh, we do know that we, she does not have the uh, uh, conventional genetic mutations. However, for all of the other more exploratory pathways, we do not have that testing available at this point. Awesome. Great work, Matthew, uh, and to your team, Team MCR. So last but certainly not least, uh, we have one more video for uh, the NF track. This is NF1 Guide. Let me pull it up. Present to you NF Guide, a platform to improve personalized care coordination across various stakeholders. And personalized being, you know, to the patient population. So the problem is that, you know, with care coordination, there are many stakeholders involved, including, you know, the primary care provider, mental health services, community health workers, nurses, providers, patients, caregivers, so, and, you know, other specialists. So, the problem that a lot of patients and caregivers, you know, were just uh, kind of mentioning when we talked to them during this event was that, you know, some sometimes the, the local uh, uh, people or, you know, providers don't have information about the disease. And so education is, is a very important part, you know, not only for the specialists, but for the local providers and the community and for everyone involved in the care of the patient. So what we propose is uh, an, a solution whereby we generate a medical report from NF1 registry. And this is just a simulation here. This is a report for an NF1 patient. So let's say you know a patient comes in with, with a report from, uh, from a um, specialist that they visited and they wanted to, then they had, they had a certain uh, condition that they wanted to know more about then uh, we use an AI-enabled technology to extract the symptoms and words from that report. And in this case, we extracted plexiform neurofibroma. This could be used you know, for, the, uh, for the patient so they could learn more about it or for the provider who's interested in learning more about the uh, plexiform neurofibromas and what are the recent management and recommendation guidelines. So we use the management guidelines to locate the text summary of the reported symptoms. So this is just one of the management guidelines. And here you could see the extracted text that was extracted for a plexiform uh, neurofibroma. And this is just an overview of the solution. Um, so basically the patient uploads their uh, report, their NF1 report. And after the, they upload their report, they uh, then, get uh, some keywords that kind of are extracted from that report, including like plexiform neurofibroma that we saw previously. So that's, you know, an indication for a symptom that they, they might have. And then based on a recommendation guidelines, this is uh, just an example of a recommendation guideline that's uh, available as part of the Children's Sermon Foundation. We kind of uh, summarize the information about that symptom. So 
you know, that helps in educating not only the providers, but also the patients and uh, their caregivers. Oops, awesome. Great work to Dana and the uh, team. Are there any questions for our last presentation? And that is all that we have. Uh, but again, want to make sure that there are no questions for Dana. Awesome. Uh, if there are no further questions, thanks everyone for sticking around. I know we went a little bit over on time, uh, but we wanted to make sure that everyone could present. Uh, so just from me personally, congratulations again to all of the teams. I think the judges will have quite a bit of fun for the next week or so, narrowing down all of the projects. Uh, and that being said, I will kick it back over to Salvo for any closing remarks. Yes, and thank you, Lucas. Uh, I think we have a great lineup of projects. So thank you so much for your presentations. Just want to make sure uh, to say once more, uh, you still have time until tonight to finalize your project submissions. So uh, today's presentation was, of course, important for your uh, evaluation, but you still have time. So make sure that your project page on the Synapse is um, the most complete uh, possible because that will be the main uh, point for judges to evaluate your project, of course, together with your presentation, but the, the project page is the most important. So make sure you have documentations, descriptions of your project as much as possible, whatever information you think is useful for them to evaluate your project. So that's my last recommendations. Thank you so much for sticking with us. There are some notes from Robert and please submit as soon as possible, because of course, team cannot support you if you have any uh, any issue until late tonight so make sure that you do it in the next few hours thank you so much everybody for sticking with us until now and have a great day <laughs>